You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines um, with Kezia Dugdale, director of the John Smith Centre at the University of Glasgow, and Anna Subri, barrister and former government minister. So let's see what's on some of the front pages for you now. Well, the front of the Metro looks into details of a car that crashed into a tent in Pembrokeshire. The headline, Tent Crash Baby in Miracle Escape. Baby in Hull's Tent Terror, reads the front of the Daily Mirror, as they also lead with this story. Lower income pupils expected to be hit hardest by grade deflation, reads the front of the Guardian as it looks at upcoming A-level results. The Daily Mail reports that record numbers of NHS patients in Wales seek care in English hospitals to escape longer Welsh waiting lists. Surprise hike to inflation next month will boost state pension, reads the eye, as it reports a temporary rise in inflation is expected for September. Brexit boost bringing business back to Britain, reads the front of the Daily Express. The Financial Times leads with its own analysis. Russian groups fudge freight costs to mitigate impact of G7 oil price cap. The Front of the Sun looks at England captain Harry Kane's move to Bayern Munich and the idea that his new baby could be born in and one day play for Germany. And the Daily Star predicts a heat wave is on the way. A reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. And uh, we are joined tonight at the moment by Anna Subri. Hope to be uh, joined by Kezia Dugdale as well. Um, but you're on your, your own, flying solo for the, the minute, Anna. Welcome to you. Let's start with this front page of the Metro and uh, the headline there, Tent Crash baby in miracle escape and by all accounts it does sound like a complete miracle take us into this story it's astonishing so a car we don't know all the circumstances of course has seemingly come off the road and crashed into the temp site and i'm going to read what the it says on the front page of the metro this is the owner's husband who says um, it was remarkable nobody was killed, but he says, this car catapulted from the road over the ditch, separating the campsite and the main road. It turned three full turns and landed on its wheels. It rolled through a tent belonging to the family, and the baby, thank goodness, was in a cot, and it would seem it was the cot that saved the baby, though we have to say that I think it's uh, that uh, two people are actually seriously injured. Three were, were rescued, but I mean, just based on that, it is quite extraordinary. And thankfully, uh, that this baby su survived what seems to be, a, we don't, as I say, know the causes, but it seems to be a, a, a terrible uh, incident in Pembrokeshire. Yes, as you say, we don't know all the, the full details, but just a, a bit more from that front page it, that after um, going through the tent, it then rolled and rested on top of three people. Uh, the campers managed to lift the vehicle 90 degrees to tilt it forward and rest on its side, and they freed the, the three people. But um, as we know, nine injured um, and in hospital. The extent of their injuries, we haven't got the full details of yet, but uh, a miraculous escape for, for that uh, child, thankfully, um, in, in their cot. Let's move on yeah. to The Guardian. Um, and this story is, um, well, it's a prediction that the, the grades might be far lower for A-level students uh, this year uh, and those that, that will be affected most are those from lower income families. So it's A-level results day on Thursday and it's now become a huge feature, hasn't it? Uh, this is in, in England and Wales because in Scotland they had their highest results, I think it was last week. But in any event, it's a, it always is a big occasion, obviously, in the life of that youngster uh, and their family. And of course, it's a big news story. And this is all really to do with the continuing the hangover from COVID. And what has happened is that the government has said, in effect, the government, but through, through the various um, bodies that regulate these things, um, that grade inflation, which some of us are a bit sceptical about, but in any event, that it is now going to be grade deflation 
because it was said that if you remember, which of course we all do, children couldn't go to school largely in 2020, and then it affected in 2021 as well. And so it was teachers that were doing the assessments, and it was said that the grades were far higher than they should have been because teachers were being overly generous to children. So the idea is to get things back to where they were in 2019. But the story in The Guardian and the point that is being made by people who know uh, about these things is that it's those youngsters from lower uh, income families who will be the hardest hit. And in a way, this does make sense because children who come from um, better off families, to use that crude expression, are, t are the ones who will tend to get extra help, either if their parents pay for, pay for extra tutoring or, or, sadly, in schools where they will put on extra classes or make extra efforts to make sure that those youngsters, who undoubtedly would have been affected, of course, in, in COVID, even though it was two years ago, in the run-up to their A-levels, they will get the extra help. That's not available for children who are not uh, from such wealthy backgrounds or even middle backgrounds, but from lower-income backgrounds. They won't have had that extra boost and so with grade deflation, as it's called, it means they are the ones who are going to get much lower grades than children who've had the benefits of getting that extra tutoring, getting that extra support at school. Mm. Uh, and there has been some criticism of the, of the government in that um, it's perhaps too much to expect students to sit normal uh, A-levels, i.e. external exams, having not even sat um, GCSEs. Exactly. And I think that what this story really should be telling us is that we should never underestimate the huge damage that the lockdowns... And I, I, I'm not, criti not criticising the lockdowns. It, they were necessary. But it's had a huge impact on our children. It's had a huge impact on their education, whatever age they are. But it's, I've always felt very, really sorry for those those older ones who went going into their GCSEs, who are now the ones who have embarked upon their A-levels. I mean, it, it disrupted their education, but it wasn't just about their education. It was all the social stuff that school brings. And, of course, the lockdowns meant that it, had, it hugely impacted what young people could do. They couldn't play sport, they couldn't socialise, they couldn't do all the things that actually enrich your experiences when you are young. And I think we are seeing... The consequences, not just in education, but I think some of the mental health increases in poor mental health amongst young people, I think, also stems from those two years where we were bedeviled with lockdowns. I'm pleased to say that Kezia does join us now with full voice. Hurrah! <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay. um, excellent. We were just discussing the, this story on the front of The Guardian uh, about the fact that low-income pupils are expected to be... Um, hit hardest by the, the grade deflation, uh, and we were talking about the possible reasons for that. If you can share your thoughts, that would be wonderful. Yeah, it's a really interesting story, and um, you might be aware that the results in Scotland have already been published mm. for students studying their nationals and hires here, and we've already gone through a new cycle where this has been very much the focus, the idea that at some point post-COVID, the education system had to revert to whatever we would call normal, and this is the year where it's going to bite, and we understand already, of course, that the COVID pandemic has had a huge impact on inequality levels across the country. What I mean by that really is that the poorer you were, the more affected you were by the COVID pandemic. And that is just as true in the education system as it is anywhere else. Hence why this reverting to the old style of the education system, which is just about grades and not about teacher markups or, or influences we had during the pandemic, is going to see a lot of students from poorer backgrounds lose out. Hmm. Let's move on to the I and, and this story about um, inflation, a surprise hike, says the, the headline next, next month, which will boost the state pension. Anna? Yes, so this is all about the fact that we have this thing called a triple lock, uh, which was introduced by the coalition government in uh, 2011. In short, it's this. If you receive a state pension, you are guaranteed that you will get whatever's highest, either a 2.5% two, two rise, or you'll get uh, whatever the average um, wage rise is, or you'll get whatever inflation is. And it's predicted that inflation will go up um, in September. It dropped back, but it will go up again. And that obviously will have big implications for the Treasury 
Uh, great if you're a pensioner, because you will get a rise in line with inflation, at least 6.5%, if not a little higher. Um, uh, and But it has huge implications for the Treasury. Uh, and it's being said that that means that all the things that Jeremy Hunt wants to do, he won't be able to do, apparently including tax cuts. And I have to say, the idea that we should be having tax cuts, tax cuts, at the moment, given the dire straits that our economy is in, is, is about as irresponsible as electing Liz Truss as Prime Minister with her <laughs> terrible budget about this time last year. <laughs> uh, and, Kezia, we read that the, the Treasury is um, urging uh, the, the Chancellor to... well urges backbench Tories to stay patient and wait for lower taxes, but they are somewhere on the horizon. <laughs> yes, and that's a big factor of trying to keep the Conservatives disciplined um, ahead of the next general election. And really, that's what this story is about. It's a general election story because this time last year, inflation was soaring and the Treasury took the decision to suspend the triple lock momentarily, and that led to a pension increase around 3.2%. There's no way the Chancellor is going to do that this year, especially when pensioners are on the cusp of a boom here. So you can be pretty sure that whatever happens um, with inflation rates in September, that will be passed on to pensioners. Just to put it in a little bit of context, the highest rise in the history of the pension triple lock has been 5.2%. Inflation is currently sitting at 6.8%. And as we've just discussed, it's going to rise potentially in September. So it looks as if we're about to see the most significant rise in the state pension in the history of the triple lock, and certainly for 10 years. That is good news for pensioners. It's not so good news for Jeremy Hunt, I think, who would rather have much more control over what he would like to gift the country ahead of a general election. Just a quick... We've just got time to have a look at this uh, Daily Mail story, um, and this is about uh, Welsh patients uh, seeking care in English hospitals because they're trying to escape their longer waiting list, Anna. Yes, so there are a lot of people who live in Wales, um, but actually they can go into England if, because of where they live in Wales, right on the border. It works the other way as well, because there are people in England who can also go into Wales um, uh, and they can have treatment there. And some of the health boards in Wales, because that's what they call it in Wales, they, they sit and straddle actually over the border. But in any event, the story by the Daily Mail, the voice of reason, <clears throat> is that people, patients in, uh, in Wales, Welsh people, Welsh residents, are escaping w Wales's longer waiting lists. Uh, and, of course, Labour has uh, a Welsh government that's run by uh, Labour. And so it's, it's a backdoor. It's, it's like Kezia says. This is, is all part of the run-up to a general election, even though it's, it's nearly 18 months away. Um, and it's all about that. And it's basically saying you can't trust Labour to run the NHS. Look what's happening in Wales. It, it's, it's basically that. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Kezia and... Anna, welcome back to both of you. Um, now, this is just a, well, very distressing story. We're going to turn to Hawaii. Um, this is the Metro's piece, their headline, Worst Disaster Ever. Um, and the, the people there are just suffering terribly. We spoke to a couple this evening who um, really thought that they were going to die and, you know, contacted their families to tell them as much. It, it's just... Uh, well, it has been a, a living hell, an in inferno. Kezia? Yeah, it's just an awful story. And as you can see from this article, it's now declared as a reality that this is the worst natural disaster ever to have hit Hawaii with 93 declared dead. And a horrific detail in particular is that of those 93 dead, only three so far have actually been able to be identified. Such was the extent of the inferno, such was the, the horrors that have bestowed at this particular island community. We've also had the lead politician in the island, Josh Green, say that he expects death uh, toll to rise considerably further. So I'm afraid it won't be the last of stories we've heard from Hawaii and we're expecting to see this horrific death toll uh, rise yet still. Yes, uh, and Anna, well, we, we know that um, more than a, a thousand still missing unaccounted for. And as um, Kezia says, the expectation is that the death toll will continue to rise. Yeah, you just know that, don't you? And one of, of course, it's, it, it is a, the ultimate human story of people who have remarkably survived and now they are looking for members of their family. And there are people who are, have lost nine members of their family. They are missing. I mean, obviously, 
we hope that they will be fine, found, but there's that terrible fear that most of them will not be found alive. Um, and the, 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 the story in the Metro talks about um, one search area, which is five miles across, and five, it's five by five miles of utter devastation and fire, which just, you know, just doesn't, it just destroys everything. And it's melted uh, metal. Um, and of course, it's got pollutants in the water, the air quality is, is dreadful, and so on and so forth. But trying and, and imagining trying to search an area of, of that size, having gone through this terrible inferno, with the thought that, you know, they may, may never find some of these people, never mind, be able, you know, won't be able to identify them. It's just awful. Awful. Yeah, terrible thought. And uh, up to 4,500 uh, people are without shelter. Um, so, yes, attention turning to, to those that, that uh, have survived and how they now cope. Let's look at this story in the mirror. Uh, and it's one of um, people really talking us through how they might fare if ticket offices are, are acts. And, and these are disabled people who, who will not be able to to access um, stations. T tell us about these examples, Kezia. Yeah, so again, this is a, a really interesting story and what lies behind it is really that the nature of how we buy our train tickets is changing. We're far more likely now to buy our train tickets electronically and perhaps you know, open up an app on our phone for a conductor to, to scan it whilst we're sat on the train, just like banking's changed with so uh, many fewer of us actually going into branches to take out our money and doing all our banking online instead. And this is forcing rail companies to consider closing their ticket offices, not least because in so doing, they will save a considerable amount of, of money, leading to some job losses as well. But of course, in the mix of all of that is the reality that there are still an awful lot of people across the country who really rely on ticket offices. And actually, there, there are two sides to the story. One part of it is about, of course, people with disabilities who need that extra help to access public services they're entitled to, just like anybody else, to be able to use the trains freely. But separately, I think there's a big issue here about safety and security. I think people don't like yes. the idea that they could be on a train platform and be the only person in, in the town waiting for that train. And a great deal of comfort is brought to people, particularly women, I would argue, from knowing that there is a member of train staff, you know, in, in the premises within touch and distance or would hear a cry for help in a particular circumstance. So I think the trail operators are about to realise there's an awful lot of people who really want ticket offices to stay, despite these technological developments that most of us still welcome. Yeah, and it's not always that easy, even if you are um, tech savvy, to, to, to buy a ticket that way. Sometimes you just need a, a real person, Anna. Yes, you do. And the other thing, because I, I don't want to... I mean, I'm going to go into the fact that I love trains, probably in a way that's <laughs> almost unhealthy. But genuinely, I love trains. Uh, and I will, uh, I will always travel on the train. I have that option. Um, and one of the things, if you do use the apps, and some of these apps are very good, and there's no debate about that, but not everybody has that sort of phone. You know, we actually have problems that not everybody is on the internet. But the thing that really is important, apart from the fact that you need human beings around, and we increasingly are living in an age where we're getting rid of human beings. And as Kezia says, come an emergency, come somebody needing help, you need a human being. There's also this. If you go on these apps, you get these things where you get a bit of a ticket. That, so I was going up to Chesterfield, or up to Sheffield, and I get one ticket that takes me to Long Eaton, and then the next ticket is a different type of ticket that it does finally get me to my destination. And it's incredibly complicated, and you just want to know that you are obviously getting the best deal. And there is nothing better than a human being sat behind the screen at Loughborough Station who will tell me this is the quickest way, this is the cheapest way to get to your destination. By and large, you can't beat a bit of human contact. I absolutely agree. Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.